Hi everyone, uh, today's class is on interstitial lung disease or ILD. Before we know what is ILD, we need to know what is interstitium. Interstitium is the loose connective tissue that is present in the lung. So all these air spaces and the vessel lie inside this loose connective tissue. We can see in the left upper quadrant diagram, the space between the alveolus and the capillary is filled by connective tissue called the interstitium. And in the right lower quadrant diagram, you can see that if this interstitium is scarred, there is problem in diffusion. So we cannot take the oxygen inside or leave the carbon dioxide out of the body through the lungs because there is scarring in the interstitium. So there are three types of interstitium. First is the axial interstitium which is surrounding the bronchi, artery, venules. This is mainly at the lung root. The peripheral interstitium in the diagram we can see a picture of the secondary pulmonary lobule. The yellow colored is the peripheral interstitium. It is present along the lobule. Uh, the central lobar interstitium is uh, nothing but the first diagram that was shown. It is between the alveolus and the vessel. So there are more than 200 disorders which can affect the interstitium. Uh, we can classify it as granulomatous or non-granulomatous based on what we see on the pathology or depending upon the occupational exposure as occupational or non-occupational. Depending upon the days uh, of complaints or the duration of complaints, we can classify into acute or chronic interstitial lung disease. So initially if we see all these diseases were classified under a broad umbrella term called diffuse pulmonary lung disease or DPLD. So as the research progressed, the classification looks something like this. So here we can see that it has been classified into ILD of known cause in that is there an exposure of drugs. So drugs also can affect the interstitium and cause ILD, uh, amiodarone, nitrofurantoin are few of them. So exposure to organic or inorganic dust causes inflammation in the interstitium and ILD. If a person is exposed to organic dust, it is called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. If inorganic dust, it causes pneumoconiosis. Toxic gas inhalation and also radiation can cause interstitial lung disease. Another ILD of known cause is collagen vascular disease. Again, if there is no cause that is um, uh, found out or explained, uh, we classify this ILD into idiopathic interstitial pneumonitis. Again, it is subdivided into IPF which has classical features or ILDs other than IPF. In that we have 6 of them, DSIP, RBILD, COP, acute interstitial pneumonia, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia and non-specific interstitial pneumonia. If we see granulomatous inflammation in the pathology when we take a biopsy, it is called granulomatous lung disease. Example for ILD due to granulomatous lung disease is sarcoidosis and also there are other causes which can cause ILD. So we need to know the most common features which is seen in most of the ILDs. Patient usually comes to you with complaints of breathlessness or dry cough and when we take a chest x-ray to evaluate for the breathlessness or dry cough, we see that there are reticular or nodular patterns, I will come to the detail later and we have to do a PFT to assess the lung function which is usually restrictive and when we do an ABG in sick patients, we can see that there is hypoxemia and increase in the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. So the most typical one is the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I will be talking about that more than other ILDs. So here in ILD we should understand that in the interstitium there is some inflammation. So this inflammation is similar to what happens on the skin. If there is a wound it heals with a scar. So if there is inflammation or wound in the lung it heals with scar and this scar is permanent. It does not revert back. So the lung which is usually like a sponge gets converted into something like the coconut fibers which covers the coconut. So it becomes fibrosed completely. So there is some inciting agent which causes this inflammation. After that there is healing leading to fibrosis. The, all the lung parenchyma is replaced by fibrous tissue. And the different areas of the lung will be in different stages. In one part of the lung it can be inflammation, in the other part it can be already completely fibrous. So this inflammation keeps on happening even after removal of the inciting agent which is causing inflammation. So this disease is a progressive disease that is why the patient comes with complaints of progressive dyspnea. This is a progressive disorder because different parts of the lungs will be in different stages of the disease. So here if we see the diagram there is lung injury, if the etiology is known it is due to a known etiology, if the etiology is not known it is idiopathic interstitial lung disease. So this lung injury causes inflammation due to which the macrophage gets uh, pulled up into the alveoli, then there is fibroblast recruitment, the fibroblast starts proliferating and they persist there 
and this causes the activation of the fibroblast and myofibroblast differentiation this leads to deposition of collagen elastin and fibrous tissue leading to fibrosis of the lung so if a patient comes uh, with this history of uh, dry cough and uh, breathlessness which is progressive we need to take a thorough medical history first we should know what is the age of the patient because usually ipf will be in elderly age group connective tissue disorders can be seen in younger individuals duration to see if it is acute interstitial lung disease or chronic interstitial lung disease symptoms and also smoking history because some interstitial lung disease like rbild dsip and ipf will be more common in smokers occupational history because we need to know if it is pneumoconiosis environmental exposure like exposure to birds or uh, uh, exposure to uh, hay in the farmers that also will give us a clue that it is hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh history of medication and drugs is also very important and history of fam family history is also very important and signs and symptoms of connective tissue disorders like joint pain tenderness uh, skin lesions have to be carefully elicited so if the history is not suggestive of any particular etiology then only we can call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis so when we examine the patient clinically usually in ipf the subjects are elderly and they come with subacute to chronic dry cough and progressive breathlessness if we check the saturation it will be usually normal uh, depending upon the amount of involvement of the lung but if the patient walks and comes back there is a sudden desaturation that we can notice along with tachycardia and uh, two thirds of the patient can also have clubbing because of chronic hypoxemia and classic velcro rails are heard at, at the basal regions when we auscultate the patient this velcro rails is like when we remove the velcro patch uh, the sound that we hear is what we hear on auscultation and it is usually basal and it is end inspiratory end inspiratory is because once the inspiration starts the air has to move from the trachea till the alveoli and then comes the interstitium there the expansion of the interstitium these velcro crackles are end inspiratory is because inspiration starts from the trachea and goes till the alveoli and then is the interstitium so when we take an inspiration alveoli comes at the end of the inspiration so the velcro crackles are heard at end inspiration so once we examine the patient and take the history uh, of dry cough and progressive breathlessness and the velcro rails are there we suspect an ild so we have to take an x ray for this patient and x ray in all these patients can have different patterns x ray can show multiple findings it can just be lines that is linear shadows it can be reticular where the lines are randomly distributed all over there can be honeycombing or nodular shadows can be seen or nodular and lines that is nodular and reticular shadows can be seen called the reticular nodular shadows so if we see this chest x ray the above x ray is the normal one below we have the interstitial lung disease mostly more than 90% of the patients coming with symptoms will have abnormal chest x ray these chest x ray uh, this chest x ray will show peripheral reticular opacities we can see in the x ray that there are lines in the lower part and they'll be uh, bilateral and symmetrical and if we compare the volumes between the normal and the uh, abnormal x ray we can see that the lung volumes have reduced usually we don't find pleural effusion lymphadenopathy or consolidation kind of findings until the patient has pneumonia so we can see the other x ray where there is a circle inside that we can see something like a honeycombing so when we see this chest x ray we should suspect interstitial lung disease so we need to go ahead with hrct so why we should do hrct is because it is more sensitive and more specific it helps in diagnosing the case not only that we can see how much of the lung is involved what all parts of the lung is involved to prognosticate and if we need a biopsy where should we take the biopsy from it also helps us in prognosticating if too much of lung is involved maybe the person doesn't have much uh, life left and also for the follow up so here we can see that in the early ild we can see lines that is the reticular pattern in the second diagram we can see that it is subpleural and there is basal predominance it is just below the pleura and basal the lung bases are more commonly involved honeycombing can be seen in the third diagram in the anterior in the upper part of the picture and uh, because of this fibrosis it 
pulls the um, bronchioles or bronchi apart causing traction bronchiectasis. HRCT also helps us to uh, rule out other differential diagnoses like asbestosis, connective tissue disorders, hypersensitivity pneumonitis and sarcoidosis. If more of ground glass is present, it might not be IPF. We have to think of other uh, diagnoses and also if it is present along with fibrosis, we need to think of interstitial lung disease. So once we do the chest x-ray and uh, CT and find out that the patient has ILD, we need to know how bad is the pulmonary function. So we have to do PFT and also body plethysmography. Here we can see that the residual volume, functional residual capacity and the total lung capacity is decreased. Because in interstitial lung disease, there won't be much expansion of the lung, there is more of restriction because the uh, expansile capability of the lung is decreased because of the fibrosis. And uh, we can see in the diagram the red color line shows that it is restrictive. So there is no obstruction, this graph is smooth but we can see that the volumes end at 4 liters. If the normal capacity of the lung is 6 liters, here it is 4 liters because of the restriction abnormality. And the diffusion capacity is decreased that can be seen by DLCO. And 6 minute walk test when we do, the distance covered by a patient is decreased because of the breathlessness and the patient desaturates on walking a little bit also. In acute cases, we can do an ABG which shows hypoxemia and increase in the alveolo arterial gradient of oxygen. So the ox amount of oxygen in the alveoli compared to the artery will be more because the diffusion is not happening. Do we have to do a bronchoalveolar lavage or biopsy in these patients? So it depends if we need to rule out any infection or any other alternate diagnosis only in selected cases we have to do bronchoalveolar lavage. Transbronchial lung biopsy has to be done to rule out other diagnosis or if the diagnosis is doubtful. Usually in IPF classical HRCT finding is enough to uh, diagnose a patient with IPF. If required only transbronchial lung biopsy has to be done. Video assisted thoracoscopic biopsy, we can take transbronchial lung biopsy or transbronchial cryobiopsy also. Only if that does not give a solution or we need a bigger piece of tissue for uh, further investigation, we need to do video associated thoracoscopic biopsy. So the general approach is that once we take the history, we need to find out if it is idiopathic or non-idiopathic. If it is potentially idiopathic, we need to do a HRCT. Once the HRCT is done, if it is diagnostic of IPF or any other disease, we need to stop there and start the treatment. And if the diagnosis is uncertain, then we have to do bronchoalveolar lavage or transbronchial lung biopsy. If the transbronchial lung biopsy gives a diagnosis, then we start the treatment. If not, then we, if not, we have to go with surgical lung biopsy. And then we will get to know if it is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or some other interstitial lung disease. This is the ATS or ERS diagnostic criteria for uh, IPF. And coming to the treatment, once we have diagnosed the patient, assessed the um, uh, physiological abnormality, we need to treat the patient. So the base, basic principle is that patient is having inflammation which is leading to fibrosis. So we need to treat the inflammation, we need to bring down, bring down the inflammation so that there is no fibrosis. But the fibrosis which has already occurred is permanent, we cannot reverse that but we can also use antifibrotic drugs to prevent this fibrosis. So first is corticosteroids, it's an anti-inflammatory agent. We start with 0.5 mg per kg per day for 4 weeks and then slowly taper to prevent the HPA axis suppression. Uh, we can also use other immunosuppressives and uh, cytotoxic agents and antifibrotic agents. So when do we use the cytotoxic agents? When they are steroid responders or there are adverse effects or there is high chance that they might have adverse effects. We can use azathioprine with or without corticosteroids. And antifibrotic agents mainly we use is perfenidone. There is another drug which is in use right now called nintedanib. Uh, we can also help the patient uh, with producing sputum, with bringing out the sputum by using uh, n cysteine. So staging and prognosis, uh, prognosis is usually good if the patient is of younger age, female and shorter symptomatic period. If the symptomatic period is shorter, then we have picked up the ILD uh, at an early stage, so the prognosis is better. If there is ground glassing, it indicates that there is inflammation on the HRCT. So at this stage, the fibrosis has not happened, so if we treat, this inflammation can be reduced. 
So the length of the therapy, usually any treatment we start takes some time for the improvement. So more than three months it might take for the improvement. In the absence of complications, we can continue the treatment up to six months and then we have to keep following up the patient. Pulmonary rehabilitation program is making the patient do exercises respiratory and also general so that the patient's exercise capacity increases. Lung transplantation is the last resort. We can opt for lung transplantation in patients who are deteriorating really fast, requiring oxygen and having severe functional impairment. So conclusion is that till date we don't have a proper treatment for this to improve the quality of life or survival but with whatever is there we can control the inflammation and fibrosis. There's another very important interstitial lung disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Because India is an agricultural country, we should know that the prevalence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis is very high and usually confused with IPF. Why should we know the difference is because HP is treatable. With treatment, HP reverses, but with IPF, it's a progressive fibro fibrotic disorder. So in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the history is what is important, exposure to uh, farm, uh, if the patient is a farmer or exposed to birds or any organic matter, uh, we have to think more in terms of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. In hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, the upper lobe is more predominantly involved when compared to IPF, which is lower lobe predominant. And also, uh, we have more of nodules in hypersensitivity pneumonitis on CT and in IPF, it is more of honeycombing and fibrosis. So interstitial lung disease can be secondary to connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, Jogren's, SLE, myopathic inflammatory myopathies. So the general approach is that a thorough history has to be taken and then we need to evaluate the patient properly. We, if we are suspecting CTD, we have to look for skin lesions and joint lesions and also history like difficulty in swallowing, Raynaud's phenomenon and proximal muscle weakness. Uh, PFT has to be done which shows a restrictive pattern. Additional tests we do here would be RA factor, anti-CCP, ANA screening and ANA profile. So here we can see that the CT appearance is completely different from the IPF. Here most of the lung is involved, it's not only basal and uh, lower low predominant. In this CT we can also see that there is an esophageal dilatation which gives us a clue that it might be systemic sclerosis. And also uh, we can see that some amount of ground glass is there. in the picture B lower part, there is lot of ground glassing and traction bronchiectasis also. So treatment is of underlying disorders, steroids and immunosuppressants and multidisciplinary approach is a must, long duration of treatment and pulmonary rehabilitation. Last resort would be again lung transplantation. So there are a few drugs like amiodarone, bleomycin, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, nitrofurantoin. These cause interstitial lung disease. Amiodarone, we need to ask for the cardiac history and if patient is being treated by amiodarone and then recurrent UTI where nitrofurantoin is frequently given. So any interstitial lung disease when suspected, we have to do a chest x-ray, we have to do a CT scan, we have to do full PFT panel to find out how much is the physiological impairment and then start on the treatment. Establishing a etiology is very important. If we don't know the etiology, then only we have to call it idiopathic interstitial lung disease. Thank you.